All right. So as, as David pointed out uh, quite clearly, that email is thriving. Um, echo off. Um, there's definitely a resurgence in people that are building not just on top of email like in the past, but actually people are building email clients now. There's, there's this just huge plethora of applications that are coming out. Once upon a time, everybody used, what, AOL or Prodigy at home and Outlook at work. And then we use the major webmail platforms like Yahoo and Hotmail, and then Gmail joined the mix. And ultimately, they actually came into both the consumer and the business ecosystem. But behind the scenes, you know, we might be using some of the main mail providers. Mail clients have taken on a whole new importance. Maybe that's because of a need to think differently about mobile email, but perhaps it's more. So one thing is for certain, and it's that there's now a choice in how we manage our email. Um, more choice than ever before. And that's what this panel is about, how to address this huge ecosystem and build the best or build on top of the most popular email clients. Um, so our three panelists have an incredible background in addressing this. Uh, first, I have Kelly Goto. She is the principal of GoToMedia, which is a global leader in research-driven, people-friendly interface design and strategy. Some of her clients are Samsung and Hyundai and Sony Ericsson's and Nokia and Adobe and Seiko, Epson Japan. She also has a book called Web Redesign 2.0, Workflow That Works, that's very popular in the design and user experience community. Um, and she's a big evangelist for design ethnography as well. And she's kind of dedicated a lot of her life to understanding how real people work with and integrate with products. Um, Jason, next, Jason Cornwell, he's the lead designer for the Gmail user experience team. So how many of you use Gmail out of curiosity? So you have him to thank for some of, uh, some of the many innovations in terms of design that are taking place there. Um, he helps guide Gmail's continued evolution through empathy for users and their stories, deep and data-driven understanding of human behavior and to have a healthy disregard for the impossible. Um, and last, Steve Whitaker. He's a professor of psychology at UC Santa Cruz. Um, he works at the intersection of psychology and computation, looking at how we live our everyday lives online. Um, he, he uses insights from cognitive and social science to design new digital tools. Um, and also, you're the editor now at HC, which, which is the HCI journal? Human Computer Interaction. It, it's, it's the top journal in the field. Yeah, so, so he knows about how people work with, uh, with computers. And his past research has been funded by, uh, by the EU, by NSF, by Microsoft, by many other folks. Um, so that's a little bit about them. But first off, I'd love to just know, you know, why is it that there is this resurgence in people building on top of and building email clients? Is it mobile? Is it the, pref you know, the prevalence of messaging within social networks or within our phones? Like, what's going on with email? Um, Steve. Well, um, I guess one thing is it's a bunch of hard problems that aren't going away. So I started working on email in the mid-90s in the Lotus Notes context, and I still see the same three problems that people are dealing with. And those problems are triage, task management, and foldering or filing, or, or basically tidying stuff up. And those problems were just about tolerable in the desktop context with a large display, but once you start moving out, especially to smartphones, but also with tablets, your display space is constrained, you can't see folders. So I think that's a reason we're seeing much more interesting clients in the smartphone space, and I think that has potential to migrate back very interestingly into the desktop. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. I think we're seeing, we've done a run of research, and I'll, sh I'll talk about this a little bit in a, in a minute, about the mix of communication technologies that people are using to get their work done. Um, and I think we're seeing this explosion of, of really interesting new channels. Um, but at the same time, email is, is really still the lingua franca for getting things done, for, um, for doing your work. Um, and exactly as Steve said, I think as we consume it in little bite-sized chunks on the go on our phones, that's really changing the way that certainly, you know, I think about designing for how people work as the context of work is changing. And from an ethnographic, you know, sort of research-based perspective, everything that we've seen is that people aren't really looking at email anymore. They're looking at communication. And so the bite-sized chunks are coming at them, and they don't remember where it came from. So they don't know if it was an SMS or if it was a Facebook post that came to them in email. And so it's all conflated right now into something that is just needing to be dealt with. And so people are looking and searching for means of dealing with this 
influx of you know just so much communication on the fly that they don't know what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to retrieve it, especially going cross device. If they move back from their smart device to their desktop, they're not quite sure who sent them a message, <clears throat> excuse me, and what they're supposed to do with it. So it sounds like some of the same problems um, that we encountered before with email are now coming through to these other products. Um, and now, you know, it's only, it's only, this problem has only gotten worse as other applications have also duplicated that information within the email. Um, so that's sort of a, a premise for what all of us think. Uh, I'm curious, uh, is there data that's supporting an actual change in behavior right now that's been happening over the last few years? Um, so one of the things that we've looked at is certainly the, the looking at college students. There was a meme a few years ago about college students not using email. So we did a bunch of studies into this. Um, looking at college students, uh, the way they were using email, and the way we, they were using the mix of communication technologies in their space, and then looking at uh, them after they left college. Um, what we saw pretty consistently was that while in college, students were using more SMS instant message type functionality for coordinating in-person events, um, for getting things done when they were all co-located in a really tight space. Um, but then as, uh, as people became geographically dispersed after they left, left college, email use shot up. And that had to do with the fact that people weren't all in the same social context, that they were juggling lots of different, um, lots of different responsibilities. They perhaps weren't available 24-7 to talk about the party the next night. Um, and this taskless nature of email, I think, started to become more important. Your communication over SMS is very transactional. It's very ephemeral. And a lot of that is um, why it's successful and why it's interesting. You don't want your SMS queue to be something that you have to manage and mark everything as read. Um, all of a sudden, it would feel burdensome. But those same qualities in email are what make it powerful, right? They're what make it essentially a to-do list created for you by others, your, your social to-do list. Um, and I really think that's at the core of why email really isn't going anywhere, right? Are these other, these other technologies that, are, that people are using in their communication mix, um, they don't have those same qualities. And they don't, have that same, they don't give you that same ability to run your, the business of your life out of that space. Rather, they're for more um, fleeting transactional um, or I need an answer right away type of, um, type of communiques. I think that in the research that we've done, um, email is basically a personal database, right? So everyone uses it in different ways. And so right now, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, a greater understanding from the consumer base that they have choices. And so they're starting to shift their behavior around how they use this particular database. And email is also owned by you personally, as opposed to being in the cloud or being on someone else's server in that way that you feel that you own that data. And so the way that you can then express that out through, if you're using Basecamp and you do messaging, it still runs through email. Or if you're on Facebook and it still runs through email. So email becomes more of a personal collection of your information, and then people can then figure out how they're going to disperse that or deal with it on a very personal level, depending on behavior. I, I think one of the other things that we've seen repeatedly is um, individual differences, which is some people, you can't stop them foldering. And we've done research which shows that Bouldering and filing and labeling, they're all a waste of time as far as uh, efficiency of refinding stuff. But there are some people who, can't, who simply can't tolerate having inboxes that are unstructured. So that's one big individual difference we see. We also see some people, I guess we see main, three main classes of email users. Some people who we call filers. There are some people who never file. You know, we, you, this isn't the AIA, so you don't need to stick your hands up and tell me which, which person you are. And then the last set of people we call spring cleaners who would like to be filers, but they just don't have the time. And I think one of the, th the exciting things about this new space of clients is before you kind of really didn't have much of a choice about uh, maybe using a different client, maybe personalizing. Um, how you used your email to fit your own uh, personality type. But I think that's a possibility um, that's now kind of uh, a, a very much uh, around. Okay. So it's, it's interesting. It sounds like there are people that use email in a top-down capacity. There are folks that, you know, with prevalence, of course, of search within email, that it's kind of the bottom-up. Um, 
our, you know, Gmail obviously bringing out labels when it did and encouraging search kind of allowed for this, there to be this new paradigm in terms of no longer just being folders. Um, are those kinds of design changes and, and some of the other bigger design changes you've seen, are that, is that actually, is that changing behavior? Is it possible to encourage and change behavior with, with email design or is it really just this novel idea that we'd like to think but people won't change? Um, I think it's definitely possible to change behavior through design. Um, you have to be very judicious about it. I mean, every time that we change Gmail, what we're essentially doing is taking our most expert users and reducing their expertise. So, <clears throat> in, in introducing new systems and new features. So that's, you know, that's something that you, it's a huge, I think, responsibility for those of us that work on email products to make sure that we really are solving real problems. Um, but I think there are real problems. So one of the things that I've observed over the years of doing Gmail user research is people coming into the lab and asking to see their Gmail inbox and this moment of hesitation and shame, right? <laughs> the sense of, oh, I'm inviting you into this messy space um, and it's my fault that I'm not doing a better job curating this space. There are weeds in my garden. I should have, I should have cleaned it up. Um, and really I see that as a fundamental problem that those of us in this room need to help fix. Um, I think email works, right? We, we all use it. It's almost like the, um, the, the wiring of our collective, um, our collective organism. But uh, it creates this sense of shame in people. And I think when you, look, when you look at how people feel about their inboxes, people feel overwhelmed um, and they feel like they're not doing a good enough job. So certainly one of the things that we're trying to do in Gmail, one of the things that I hope everyone in this room is doing, is thinking about how can we, how can we fix that fundamental problem, this tool that we all use, that we're all dependent on to get all of our work done practically as a, as a species, um, <laughs> makes us anxious and depressed, right? So um, I, I think there's an enormous responsibility, sort of ethical responsibility to, to address that. Um, and I think it's possible to do. So one of the things that we introduced recently was automatically categorizing messages by type and then presenting them in the inbox by, by type and doing that, not just doing that, but doing that by, the def by default. Um, and really that's what we've seen in studies is that that's a pretty big step that users that felt overwhelmed by their, this large ma undifferentiated mass of messages that they were getting, well, for most people, they're not really getting that many personal messages a day. So when you're able to discreetly chunk these types of messages um, that they can deal with at once, so they're not necessarily a lower priority, like lots of people are really interested in getting promotional mail, for example, and that's really important. It's also important for businesses. But the ability to deal with those in a single context at once really is a pretty significant behavior change. And all of a sudden we've seen people, for example, turning notifications back on on their phones because they're getting buzzed a couple of times a day on their personal accounts as opposed to every 30 seconds um, by commercial senders. So again, that's a big change, but I think that we really have a big problem that we need to attack um, as an industry. And we're at this exciting moment where I think a lot of companies, both large and small, are experimenting with solutions to that fundamental problem. And there's widespread acknowledgement of that fundamental problem. I was just going to say that you brought up something about shame, but you also brought up trust. So people trust that there's um, enough healthy background into what you're doing that this behavior change can be done over time and that it's actually going to take effect over several years. One of the things that we've seen is this cross-device um, non-functionality. So when you switch from one device to the next or one experience to the next, contextually you're not having the same experience. Have you hit that in terms of not having IMAP ability um, for those same features across clients or how is that affecting um, sort of the space from your perspective cross device? I think this is a, re this is a really important issue. I mean from, from our perspective um, we are trying to try some new stuff um, some of it isn't a perfect match for, for IMAP. So, but that, we don't want it, that to hold us back, right? If we just implemented IMAP and put no features, new features on top of that, we really wouldn't be solving the fundamental problems that we see people have in, in the marketplace and that we see people bring into our labs and the stories that we have people tell us. So, so I think there's a balance that needs to be struck between remaining standards compliant and then being willing to try things on top of those standards that really might move the needle and then maybe evolve those standards. 
Um, so I think a, another good example of that, we have an, another um, Shalini from my team is speaking later in the, in the session about our schema.org based uh, buttons in email. And I think this is an example of trying to use standards to um, shine, a, shine the way a path forward, basically. We know that there are a lot of types of messages that you get that you don't even need to open the thing. You know, you can confirm the, your restaurant reservation or an event invite, and uh, you shouldn't need to take a lot of time to do that. So there are, are that's not part of the IMAP protocol, though, of course. So, we, but we can use schema.org to um, do that in a standards compliant open way that we hope others in the industry will pick up as well. I just wanted to add a cautionary note in terms of this innovation space. Um, some of our experiences, um, so I come from a research context where often we build quite radically different clients. So I remember one of our experiences around 2000 was we built a social network based UI to email, which techies adored, right? Because they said, what? So I, I talk more to these people, and so I, get, I can see emails from just those people. But when we actually deployed this to kind of regular working people, they, did not, they were not very tolerant of this type of, uh, of interface because they were very used to dealing with email in the standard way, which is like a time-sequenced inbox. And their concerns were about messages that they were receiving from people who are outside their kind of tight social network. So the lesson that we drew from that is, you know, email is in a sense, it's like our oxygen. And, you know, obviously, if you're in a, a space where you define yourself by innovation, you want to put radical stuff in front of people. But we have to be realistic in the email space that whatever we put in front of people, it can't move them so far from their comfort zone and, and traditional work practices that they won't take on that client. So I think there's, you, you know, I, I think it's terrific we're seeing all this innovation, but we need to kind of tread carefully uh, because I, I think we don't want to have people react negatively to things because it's stopping them from doing really important stuff they need to do day to day. So I think you bring up a really important point, Steve, which is that there is a fine line with how far we can push people. You know, we have sort of two classes of folks in this room, those that are building existing popular webmail or email clients and those that have more niche products, whether they're widespread or not. They're, they definitely have a smaller audience that may be more like the audience you described, Steve, that's a little more techy or a little more productivity oriented. Um, and obviously, Gmail, your, your audience is widespread, and you're in a somewhat unique position in that it's both business and consumer users. Um, you had mentioned to me when we were talking uh, earlier and preparing for this, you said lately you've made, or that, that some of the design decisions that you've been making, um, in addition to the data, that you've decided to, to make some opinionated product choices. And I don't think you meant it in, in like this, this giant, like, we're just going to throw stuff at the wall kind of thing, but you made some decisions that not everybody necessarily embraced right away. Um, so I'm curious, you know, what was the impetus for moving in that direction, you know, given that you are exactly like with Steve, you're trying to figure out where that line is. So, so what, what was the impetus behind some of the new designs we've seen in Gmail? So what I, when I said opinionated product um, decisions, what I, what I meant was this. So I mentioned... Um, I just mentioned this sense of shame that we saw people feel when they would show us their inboxes. And the fact of the matter is that Gmail gives you um, a, a pretty robust set of tools to manage your, your inbox. So labels and filters are pretty amazing. You can, write, you can create all sorts of quite complex workflow systems if that's what you'd like to do. And certainly that's what the high-end users, um, high users do. Uh, across both business and um, and personal accounts, but when you look at the vast majority, um, they're not interested in figuring out their own personal workflow. Right? That's not something. That's probably something that is interesting to those of us in this room. Um, and certainly, there there are big communities on the internet for whom you know life hacking is a major thing. But most people aren't going to do that. And I think what we saw um, was that a large number of people weren't really getting much use out of the tools that we created because those tools didn't come with an opinion baked in. Like Gmail didn't tell you how to use it. It just gave you a set of building blocks and let you build your own castle, right? But most people just had a bunch of boxes on the ground. 
So, so the the new I think the the new inbox tabs are uh, the best example of this, where we want to come in and say we're going to do this categorization for you, um, out of the box. You can turn it off, um, and we to Steve's point, um, all of these design decisions come with major risks around loss aversion. So if you feel like you're missing messages or you're not seeing stuff that's coming in you're going to turn that stuff off like pretty much immediately. Like The oxygen's out of the room at that point. So um, we also had to bake in um, a pretty fi finely honed set of mechanics around notifying you that you got messages in particular categories, but having those notifications be transient so they don't build up and, and create this state that you have to constantly clear. So that's really what I meant about um, trying to be opinionated in the product that the design of the product should communicate something about how it, should, how it should be used so that users don't have to think about how they should use the tools that we're giving them, but at the same time maintain a high degree of customizability so that if you don't like the way it works out of the box, you can you know, pick different tabs or not use that system at all and continue to use labels and filters if that's working for you. And we did talk to a few people that were using the tab system just to see what the feedback and reaction was. And I think one of the things gets back to trust is that they know that all their email is being dealt with and they're not missing anything unless it's by their own, you know, they decided that they would, you know, filter this out. So a lot of the third party solutions or apps that look great and have a visual metaphor, for instance, um, they're not collecting all the information. There's a lot of Craigslist apps, for instance, that do a great job of visually producing what's on Craigslist, but people will go back to the original because they don't want to miss anything. So that trust factor of who's building it and that they're curating your data correctly is pretty huge. And really there, there's no substitute for user testing. I mean, we, we ended up with the, at the result that um, with the tabs because of many rounds of prototyping, bringing those prototypes into the lab, looking for loss aversion cues, looking for people's emotional response to the product, then testing it you know, with, in the wild with people under NDA, looking at the drop off rates you know, where people turning this off, talking to them about why, and iterating over and over again. So the, you know, those notification semantics were incredibly important to not trigger loss aversion. And it's easy to say, for example, you might come in and say, well, everyone has this problem with promotional mail. Getting too much promotional mail, it's like a scourge. We should just get rid of it. But in the lab, we would have people say, oh, the most important stuff, my promotions, you put them right here at the top. Right? So these value judgments that you might make around what's important versus not important are not ubiquitous. And if you're going to create um, a system that tries to, to group like messages, I think you have to be very sensitive to the diversity of people that are going to use it and to these feelings of loss and change. It's got to be much, much better or else it's not worth, to Steve's point, um, forcing that change on people. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to echo this point. Um, sorry that the panel uh, agrees with one another. You know, we'll, we'll work on that a little. But um, I, I think one of our experiences speaks directly to this, which is, unfortunately, most people don't want to program email. They want to have something that does the job. Um, they hope as well as it possibly can, but they don't see themselves as, uh, as programmers. And unfortunately, our own empathy is, well, we think everybody's like us, you know, well, they should be writing macros, you know, they should be building filters, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff we like to do to make our own workflow more efficient. This is not what our average user base are interested in. Sure. So, so I'm curious, um, so you've, you've talked about tabs a few times, clearly that's been a successful experiment, if you will, you guys have been pretty happy with that. Um, I'm curious, you know, like there were, there were some other design changes that were released um, that, that, you know, sort of get to other behaviors with email, for example, on the creation side. I'm curious if you can speak at all to, to whether the new Compose, is that, has that changed people's behavior at all? Have you found that messages have gotten shorter? Have you found that, I'm, I'm just curious, um, has, that, has that had an impact in terms of user behavior in any way? Um, yes, it has, although I can't really talk about the specifics. Sure. Um, but that, that change in particular was motivated by a few things. One was, <clears throat> um, long-standing issues with multitasking. You know, seeing pain points with, with users in the lab around writing a message and being interrupted and or needing to look up some reference material that was also in that database of their mail, right? So we, I think we wanted a solution in general that um, allowed you to really quickly 
stop what you were doing and go to the inbox and look something up or attend to something else and then come back and resume um, seamlessly. Um, I know, Steve, one of the, the points that you were bringing up earlier is that multitasking can be um, pretty detrimental to people's productivity. But at the same time, interruptions are very, are, have to be, be able to be dealt with. So um, that was one, I think, facet of it. Another was this realization, looking at the data around how, what people were actually writing in email in terms of how much formatting were people doing, um, how long did emails tend to be. And also thinking about the, these college student and post-college student studies that we ran and thinking, seeing pretty consistently these results where um, this perception that email was heavyweight, was for formal correspondence only, um, and so in many cases was an option of last resort um, for, the for this college student demographic. So we looked at, these, we looked at all these things together, and I think the, the tab design, or the, the, the compose mole, we call it design, um, was born out of those three things. One, the fact that the average length of an email written in Gmail is pretty short, um, and that less than 4% of messages sent include any formatting at all, yet every time you compose an email, it's this full screen takeover giant document creation like experience. So what we wanted to do is create an, a, a, a composer that still allowed you to write really in-depth, long, formal messaging, um, but also did a better job of scaling down to something that was really short and really could run the gamut between those, those polls. You know, the, the really quick, um, almost tweet-length messages that we see an awful lot of, um, all the way up to, you know, a formal corporate memo or a very heartfelt letter that you might write somebody. And we wanted it to be a space that accommodated all of those use cases. Um, and didn't get in your way when you were trying to execute something quickly. We've been looking at a lot of uh, emotional connection to people and products, and one of the things is preserving your memories and you know, micro interactions is a big um, word out there right now for the little nuanced things that you can do in interfaces to create that kind of trust. And so for instance, if you have a draft that you started on your mobile device and it's a pretty intense draft of something and then you go to your desktop and it's saved there. So that ecosystem really does um, become more and more prevalent and expected. So I think that um, shortcutting that process of moving from device and context, I think people are having an expectation now that it's just going to be seamless. And so that needs to be kind of baked into a strategy and a product strategy overall. Now Kelly, it sounds like you've actually done a lot of research on mobile and generally your, your area of research is how do people really use these technologies or what existing behaviors they already have should motivate um, technology solutions. I'm curious, you know, everybody in this room, we're all seeing, I'm hearing my phone go off or shifting to mobile. Um, what, what, beha you know, what, are, what is the data saying that we should be doing with mobile in terms of communication? Well, it's kind of interesting and I don't want to get, you know, dark about it, but basically um, our brains are being rewired and so we actually aren't able to process longer spans of time. I don't know if you've, you know, you can. <laughs> so I was watching a movie with my kids and I was watching all the credits go forever in the beginning and now it just starts with the big scene and the credits go at the end, you know? That's true. So um, we actually are now training ourselves in this next generation to embrace little snippets of information and it's actually hugely problematic. And so our, our brains are literally being rewired. Samsung. Um, South Korea, there's all kinds of stats out there actually starting to treat three-year-olds for digital addiction. Um, kids are going to bed holding their um, tablets and when the battery life goes down, they start to get really high anxiety and stress. Um, so I <laughs> feel personally that we need to retrain ourselves to communicate at length. Be, you know, so it's not, I'm not trying to be super negative, but I think we have to take initiative to also help people rethink the way that they are communicating and, and how we're affecting this next generation. We all seem to be working on that kind of idea, like a Wayfind is working on that. We're trying to help you to get away from your email, yeah. and there's inbox snooze and pause and all these yeah, things. Yeah. But are any of those things, none of these things seem to be coming mainstream. It, yeah, it's, it's difficult because now the behavior is still at the speed of which you react, especially dealing with international clients. If you're up at three in the morning and you deal with them immediately, you're a good, good partner to them. So um, I just think we just have to, you know, it's very different in Sweden, let me just say. <laughs> so Sweden, you know, and Europeans in general, they take time off. And so culturally, we're all working together. And so the, a lot of the research that we're seeing cross device and cross cultures is that there has to be a happy medium that will be healthy for us in the future. So, so um, I just want to talk about a couple of 
uh, studies which speak to this uh, where there are interesting um, technical possibilities. So I take the point about, um, you know, we're maybe destroying ourselves and our attention uh, and so on in these various ways. So there are two studies which have looked at um, people who unplug in the work context. Um, so what a lot of corporate workers have complained about is the fact that they can't execute um, particularly in research context. So, you know, obviously if you're very client focused, you've got to be responsive. So you take a lot of interruptions. But if you're trying to, uh, if, if you're trying to do concentrated work, then email's a problem uh, for various reasons which are very well documented, which are not just notifications, but it's a database which has got a bunch of your stuff in there. So you go in there to look for a piece of information that you need for your current task, when, well, you've got four more messages and one of them's really urgent. So you're off task. So um, these two studies were looking at what happened if you basically severed people's connection from email for you know, extraordinarily long periods of time, by which I mean in corporate context, four hours. <laughs> um, so, so, well, well, actually, the, the radical version of this um, had people uh, not use email for two weeks. So I should emphasize this is in a corporate research context. Um, it was a large uh, defense contractor. Did and they, they die? Uh, <laughs> no, curiously. Did so, anybody die was this question. So there's, yes, right. So the, there's, there's two sides to this, um, one of which I guess is not very well answered by the study. But from a personal productivity standpoint, um, these people were more effective um, their stressors, so they were, all, they were wired up for um, kind of emotion detection. So you could show that these people were less stressed. In terms of their productivity, obviously they got a lot more done. Um, they tended to exchange information with others verbally in their immediate context. So all of us are guilty of uh, sending an IM to the person next cubicle or sending them a large email rather than walking over and asking them a quick question. So there were these big differences in behavior, one of which, another of which was very interesting, was this kind of increased meta treatment of your work. So people are engaged in a lot more planning. Okay, so you can say, well, that's terrific. What this study didn't look at was corporate productivity, right? So those people are just doing very well on their personal goals, but what about their clients and so on? Unfortunately, that study didn't speak to it. But there are a bunch of, I thought, rather interesting technical proposals about different ways that you could maybe handle your server traffic here. So um, if you want, if you have a bunch of kind of uh, uh, workers who need to intensely concentrate, why not just turn your email server off for four hours? <laughs> so people get their emails, 8 a.m., you've got a bunch of emails, you can compose replies, but there will be no new email until 12. Right? Ditto, you know, so a bunch of email traffic, exchanges, right? No email between 12.01 and let's say four. So people know when they've got time to be processing their email, but at the same time, they can get down to kind of being productive. So I think there are, you know, we were trying to speak to the question of, um, you know, designing people through email. That's a very interesting study. As I say, to me, it raises more questions that, that, then it kind of uh, solves. But I think that's a direction that we might see uh, corporations going when they better understand kind of what they want from their workforce. It's interesting. I mean, that's, that's sort of analogous to the Outlook's offline mode. But we no longer have, or at least many of the companies in the room are designing things for the web. Uh, there's very few that are just designing for the desktop for offline clients. And that's, that's why we all can relate to getting things done on a, on a plane. You know, it's because it's not instant anymore. Unless it would be nice. there's Wi-Fi. <laughs> well, yeah. if there's Wi-Fi, yeah, then all of a sudden we're at the office again. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, and it used to be that we didn't have video, and now like that's in all the advertisements. You can watch YouTube at 10,000 feet. You know? I think um, <laughs> the biggest thing, just super quick, is that people are checking their phones uh, without being conscious of it. And so the checking habit is um, an addiction level that's laying on the other side of the subconscious. So people 
find that they're grabbing for their phones and they're not even aware of it. So it's pretty interesting maybe just to bring another level of awareness to our activities. Yeah, it's like somebody says, I'm going to go to the bathroom when you're at a restaurant and you just there is your phone in your hand before you even realize it. Yeah. Um, one last question and then uh, I'd like to take some questions from you all. So there's a microphone right there. So if you have a question you'd like to ask for this panel, uh, just make a line behind that microphone right there in the middle. Um, my last question for you is this is, you know, there's all these insights you all are sharing. I'm curious, are, are people, them, people taking them to heart or are they building the latest shiny object? I mean, we saw, for example, that Mailbox had a great success and that a lot of companies now have these gestures into their apps. Now, there are other products that had that before, companies like, like Passbox, we get boxers now in the audience, and there are, there are a lot of other products that have been starting to do that, but that kind of went mainstream and now we even see it in iOS 7, for example. Um, I'm curious, are, are people latching on to shiny objects or are they taking this data to heart? I think people are taking the problem very seriously. So Steve brought up the three problems that he felt like had been problems with email for a long time and are still problems with email today, really haven't been solved. And I think you know the, the gestural stuff on the phone really helps with that triage use case. We also know that on the phone, that's one of the domin dominant um, email processing patterns is that you'll do a bunch of triage and then right back to some things, but then probably when you have a keyboard, right back to the longer things. Um, uh, so I don't think it's just new and shiny. I think that I think that there's also a an aspect of, and this isn't just an email. I think it's throughout the industry, the discipline that we have to use as designers when designing for a phone, and really cutting down to the core of the problem that a user has. Um, that type of design thinking is really bleeding back to to web and desktop and larger screen clients in general. So I think you know partially the those constraints on the phone have led to some new solutions that I think are quite appealing and um, are good solutions to common problems, long-standing problems. Um, I don't think that we're all, also I think there's more recognition um, that we have this problem, right? We're all talking about that. I've certainly had the phantom phone ring, right? Where I think my phone is buzzed, but it's not even in my pocket. Um, <laughs> and we just had, at, you know, at Google last week, we had a group of uh, Buddhist monks come to talk to us, really concerned about the net decrease in mindfulness in the world wow. created by you know, our, our digital products and the fact that we're also tied to I've the, got an app for that. There you That's go. Different, different. If you want the mindfulness app, I've got one. <laughs> Serious. What's it called? Your name? It's called Echo. It's something we built. We're trialing it at the moment. Come and talk to me at the break. <laughs> Um, okay, we can take that. I, I will break the question nice, but I would prefer to have questions from all of you. So if somebody else come up. I don't know if you, we have one here. Um, but so this has been great. Uh, lots of really insightful stuff. I have like about 10, 10 questions. I'm going to just ask one. Um, so Steve, you made the point about filing being a waste of time. Which I, I'm a very guilty filer. Um, and then Jason, you talked about the benefits of creating these different contexts in which to effectively folders to go through your mail, which I'm a big fan of through other inbox. Um, and so I think I know the difference between those two things, but I was hoping you guys could fight it out a little bit and just make sure that I'm clear on like why, because I don't think those are the same thing, but can you talk about that? So I can talk very specifically about our study, um, which is we um, analyzed log files for events when people were trying to re refine old information and we looked at whether or not their strategy was based on just basically scrolling through an inbox versus going to a folder. Um, and we just looked at success, you know, so I can talk, how we actually did the analysis is, is not totally relevant here, but we looked at whether or not people were successful and how long they took, depending on strategies. And what we found was that people who were using folders to refine stuff uh, were no more successful at, at refining it and they were actually about four times slower. So our argument, when you think that in the classic uh, manual foldering world, you actually have to, uh, there's, there's a time sink involved in creating folders, the conclusion we drew from that was that filing's a waste of time. However, Jason will want to talk to the, uh, the broader scope uh, of filing activity. So, I, and I think that that's certainly a paper that we've um, spent a lot of time reading and talk about a lot. Um, on the Gmail team, but the, the, there's also this notion of batch processing. So if, you've, if you're looking for something that you dealt with in the past, then the fact that you filed it 
doesn't help you find it any faster, right? So it's no, there's no efficiency gain there. But if you are dealing with a set of messages that are coming in in a particular context, there are a whole host of benefits. Reduced context switching, you know, staying on one type of task. Also the ability to bulk process, for certainly for things like social networks and promotions, um, most of those you don't even have to read. So you can get rid of them all in one stroke. Um, so the benefits are there, but it, again, it doesn't, doesn't help you when you're finding something. Although, we were talking about this right before we came up on stage, for a certain set of users, I think we see continued filing behavior because it gives you the warm fuzzies. It makes you feel like you, you did a good, you're on top of your space and yeah, it's not as shameful. You've cleaned up your room, right? So there's, there's and that's a real benefit. That's, I'm not making light of that benefit. That feeling of um, I'm on top of my digital space, I'm on top of my to-do list is valuable. Yeah, because control, I, I think uh, there's the shame and there's also the, the positive side is control. And I think one thing that foldering can do, like tidying your environment, is give you a sense that you're, uh, you know, just only temporarily that you're master of your domain or mistress. Yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing to that, and I'll take the question, is, is you know, I, I did training for a number of years, and you find that people file not just for the sake of getting it out, although there is that, but also people don't realize how powerful search is or how to use it effectively. So they still do look in the receipts folder to find the receipt, even though they could search for the word United and find the airline receipt if they wanted. So it's, I think there is some education that can play into all this, perhaps, I don't know. So is it fair just as follow up to say that it's, uh, it's filing stuff yourself is not helpful, having things filed for you before you look at the mail is? Well, no, I think because you might file a set of things before you dealt with them and then go into that context and deal with that set. And that still gives you some benefit. I think it's about later retrieval versus working in a space, is at least how I would characterize it. Processing versus search. We have time for two more questions. Okay, perfect. Um, I run an event uh, calendar business, and I got about a half a million users who basically ask for their events to be delivered in an email uh, every week. And I've noticed when Gmail did your campaigning segregation that my open rate has dropped to three to four percent, and I get a nonstop amount of complaints from people who cannot see or access that email any longer, and they just don't know where to look for, or they don't set up their settings. So it really hasn't helped my business at all or my members. Um, and uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was, when are we going to create a platform where the email that I send looks the same on everybody's server? I know Hotmail um, uh, and, and Outlook completely looks totally different than, uh, and then depending on which operating system you're opening, which email server, is, is there a point where we're gonna come together and just decide on how an HTML email is going to look across all platforms to make it easy for us? I don't think so. I, I, I think people are, are going to want to be different, right? Companies are want to be different. They're going to want to be different and look different. Things are going to look different no matter what because there are going to be different displays of headers and things. And now clients are getting smarter about what they compress in terms of signatures and headings. But it would certainly be nice if at least the HTML component of the middle were all the same. And that probably will happen in time. Um, that's happening much more so in the browser space. But mobile messes all that up. So. It's, it's hard. Do yeah. you have something you want to add, Jason? Oh, yeah, I also hope that that gets more consistent. You know, certainly in, in web products, one of the problems is that we're re-rendering web content already in an existing web application. And so there are lots of transformations that we have to make to the HTML for like security reasons to make sure that you're not ejecting content into, into Gmail's UI itself and then spoofing it. Um, but so I think there's, there are big technical, um, there's a, a big technical challenge to do that, but I would love it if we solve that problem. And then your first question, you asked, um, you were talking about uh, re reduction in open rates um, for these messages that you were sending. And I think that this is something, that we took this very seriously when we um, implemented this feature in thinking through the fact that um, we have lots of people in the world that want to reach users and we have a set of users that feel overwhelmed and stressed out. And we, we looked at the numbers and we didn't see very significant changes in, in or at least what we didn't perceive as, as dramatic changes in the rates of, op of opening messages. But we saw behaviors like deferral, you know, time shifting, so like the equivalent of DVR. I'm gonna deal with all of my promotions at once or all my social updates at once. Um, so we're also trying to work with um, tools like um, the, the buttons in the inbox, using schema.org, which we'll talk again later, so that 
um, your users can respond to those calendar invites with a single click without having to open it. So our goal here is really to serve um, recipients' needs around not being overwhelmed and give them a lot of choice as to how they deal with their incoming messages. So for your users, if they want to drag um, your messages into the primary tab, they can teach Gmail to do that you know, for, forevermore. Um, if they want to disable the tabs, they can do that as well. But really, we want those decisions to be owned by the recipient of the messages. Um, we're also pretty sure that you know, for those of you sending um, content to, um, to large audiences, if your users really like your content, they're still going to get it. And we wouldn't have launched the feature if that wasn't the case. Yeah, we just have one quick, uh, quick response to your last question, sir. I'm not sure this is quick, but uh, I, I actually re read my email with a heavily modified MHE system, so I may be atypical. But I, I don't quite see why SMS and uh, Facebook updates and Twitter and email haven't all merged into a single user interface. So I, I, think, I think that's a really good comment, actually. And my response to that would be that there are different social expectations around these different mediums that we have built up, we basically have different social contracts around them. So the, the amount of time that you expect, whether or not you expect a response, when you're willing to send a message, how long you're expecting it to take to get a message, those social expectations are different around these different channels. Um, and I don't think you can just abstract away those details, that there's something um, about these notification semantics of the channels that we use heavily um, we use them heavily for a reason, and we use multiple channels for a reason. It's because um, we expect different types of responses, and that there is real value in the different social expectations that, as a society, we've developed around these different channels. Although, from a technical perspective, it certainly seems appealing to unify them. I think, from a human perspective, it would be a rough road. Yes, and we've seen, uh, we actually built a client that kind of rendered mess all messaging into, into a, an email database, and people said, the IMs look completely weird. They're full of misspellings. So it's a genre difference, right? They're written in a particular context with particular expectations, and they read weird. You know, they could be useful, but they read weird to people. I think the notifications actually are working if they come into one place from the research that we've seen. And just um, we call it, uh, I guess, contextual etiquette. And so there's etiquette around people and culture and mediums for these different channels. But um, you know, a long time ago, years ago, we did a lot of uh, ethnographic-based research and really came up with this idea of a super inbox for one of the larger you know, players in this industry. And now it's really coming to fruition. So being able to have one place to receive a lot of notifications, but then being able to respond um, in each channel, I think, is preferred. I mean, for not everybody. But it is something that has been built over time and asked for, and, and I think it's working in some ways. And then another thing I think that's super valuable there is even though you might not want to have a merged queue of these different types of things to go through, um, being able to search across larger corpuses that includes multiple types of information is super valuable. Because you might not, you made a comment earlier, you might not know whether a piece of information came in through you know, one of any number of channels. Sure. You can't find it. Yeah. Um, and it's important for the notification semantics to be appropriate for the channel. But when you're looking for a piece of information, you should just be able to find that piece of information. Well, that's, uh, that's a great thought to, to, to finish with the idea of bringing together all these communication channels. We're seeing some of that happen in Gmail. and. Definitely coming. So thank you all so much to our panelists, Jason, Kelly, and Steve.